You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Gulseth. I'm Andy Bates. It is Bach Week still. Uh, this is super exciting. And I have to say, we are recording um, all of these. And today's recording is actually on box commemoration date. So this is super exciting, extra super exciting <laughs> today. Um, and Andy is with us today as well. I know he's, he didn't get to do the first two of these, but that's OK. Yes, It's OK. We're going to have extra fun today. Uh, joining us today. Oh. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin, for your support of the Coffee Hour. I almost forgot I was so excited about Bach. You can learn more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live uncommon. Today we get to talk about the theology in Bach's music, and we're just we're we're gonna barely scratch the surface today <laughs> because there is so much music and so much theology. Uh, joining us today to talk about all of the theology in J.S. Bach's music is Dr. Maurice Boyer, professor of music at Concordia University, Chicago, and director of the American Contrai, which is a group that's dedicated to the performance of J.S. Bach's music. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour, Dr. Boyer. Thanks so much, Clyde. Really great to be back. We're always happy to talk to you about Bach and really dig into all of the theology in his music, uh, get into the weeds on purpose a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is always really fun to do. Um, and today we're talking about this theology, how people can approach his music and really uh, see the theology that's in his music. So how is music a, a uniquely suited medium for uh, studying and learning about theology? Well, I would say one of the things that is great about uh, Bach's music uh, is the layering he's able to do um, musically. Um, obviously, something that we can't do when we speak is we can't say multiple things at the same time, right? Uh, I mean, maybe some people are gifted and can do that, um, but I don't know too many. Um, so with music, you can do, you can have one affect going on or one emotional layer or even one ideational level, you know, one idea uh, going on in one voice voice and another idea going on in another uh, voice, you get not only a polyphony of voices, um, musical voices, but also a polyphony of ideas. Uh, and so I think I would say that's the one way in which Bach also uh, is unique in his uh, way of doing theology uh, through his music. Uh, so that would be the, the first thing that I would say about that, and maybe the most important I would venture to add. And Bach is known for not just voice, but I mean, voice and, and, and choral and organ music, instrumental. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry, so excited about, about Bach today. The words just words. don't. Yes. So let's talk about sacred choral music. Uh, tell us about the sacred choral music that Bach produced during his time in Leipzig. So uh, when Bach makes his way to Leipzig in 1723, he's already done a lot of different kinds of things before that. He's written some cantatas, although not that many when it comes down to it. He's written a lot of instrumental music, a lot of keyboard music before that in, uh, in Kürten and then in, uh, I mean in Weimar and then in Kürten before he makes his way to Leipzig. So he's done a lot. When he gets to, to Leipzig, that's when he really um, jumps headlong into writing cantatas pretty much weekly and sometimes working on a couple of different cantatas a week, um, producing at, you know, during Holy Week passions, uh, passion settings. Um, and as, I, as you know, in the church year, there are some feast days that have multiple uh, iterations, not iterations, but multiple days in them, for instance, Christmas and then day after Christmas and then the second day of Christmas and so forth. Um, and so some very busy uh, feast days during the year. So he uh, provided music, concerted music, th that is music with uh, instruments for those particular days. So that's, well, we know how many weeks there are in a, in a year. So that gives us an idea as to what, uh, as to how much he was producing, especially in his first three years in Leipzig. Um, after that, he, the, the writing of cantatas is a little more sporadic, kind of uh, trails off. Um, we don't really know why. Um, but uh, what we do have is three full cycles of cantatas, um, one in, the, in 1723 to 1724. And they all start on Trinity Sunday, uh, or the, sorry, the first Sunday after Trinity. And that's because that's, that was the day on which he started his tenure in Leipzig. So the first cycle goes from Trinity plus one, 1723. 
uh, and to the to Trinity Sunday, and then Trinity Plus One for the for the second year. And interestingly, the second year stops uh, short of the full cycle. So he basically makes his way to Palm Sunday, which that year lined up with Annunciation. And so Annunciation trumps Palm, Palm Sunday. And so it, what he wrote for that day is, a, is an Annunciation cantata. Um, and then after that, it's the second version of St. John Passion, which is a chorale, cantata, a chorale passion, different from the first version. It's the lesser known of the two. And then after that, he resumes. He has um, a different cycle starting la- um, around Trinity for the rest of the year, uh, that following year. So um, a lot of writing, uh, especially in those first three years. Pretty astonishing what, uh, what came to the fore. I mean, I didn't mention the, the, the St. Matthew Passion. <laughs> So a lot, a lot came to the fore during those few years. Mm-hmm. So much music that came out uh, from from Leipzig at that time, which is it is still just mind blowing to think about how much music we have from from this one person. So, what is the place of the cantata um, or the, or of the passions in the liturgy of the church? Mm-hmm. I'll focus mainly on the chorales today, and and my reason for that is I know you. Um, have had Matt Gerhardt with you in the studio. And I know that he talked about the Orgelbüchlein and the chorale preludes in there. And so I'll focus mainly on the cantatas, also maybe say a little bit about the about the passions. But the chorale uh, would have taken place in the liturgy on uh, Sunday morning, so the Gottesdienst, the Eucharistic service in the morning, um, and then also at the Vespers service. Uh, and in both cases, the, the cantata bracketed uh, either bracketed the sermon if it's, it was a two-part sermon, I mean a two-part cantata, or the cantata was before the sermon and after the gospel reading, and then there was different kind of music during communion. So uh, the cantata worked really uh, sort of in um, as a as a second sermon, I guess you might say, or a prelude to the sermon uh, for each of those services. So. Um, key role, really, for the cantata, not just sort of uh, decorative. It was fully a part of the service and meant to uh, be further commentary on the gospel reading of the day. Is there a typical form for a cantata? This is per- perhaps maybe more of a technical question. <laughs> no, and that's okay. I think it's a helpful thing to, to talk about. Uh, there is a basic format, and you might say that the, the most prevalent one would have, would be an opening chorus and a closing chorale. Uh, the opening chorus would be the, the most um, lavish and the most intricate, uh, involving the four, all four voices plus instruments. Um, and at the end, just usually a straight four-part chorale, almost as if right out of the hymnal. Um, it wouldn't have been intended to be sung by the by the congregation, but they would, of course, hear the chorale tune unadorned and would be able to almost sing along in their minds in their minds ear. Um, <clears throat> and in between would be a succession of recitatives uh, and arias, so um, for soloists. And uh, so restatives being rather declamatory and, and uh, the, the place where a lot more text would come would be uttered. And then the arias, you know, of course, f- fewer words usually and, um, and uh, with accompaniment. So uh, just more like a song if you're not familiar with, uh, with this music. Um, but that's the, that's sort of painting a really uh, you know very sim- simplified version of what the chorale is. Bach is always creative in reimagining the form depending on what the text is that's before him. Um, in his second year of of work in Leipzig, um, I mentioned that second cycle, and during that second cycle, he's being uh, he's decided that his focus is going to be the chorale. Now, the chorale is, oh, has always been a part uh, of the cantata. It's always been a part of the service, you know, in the organ preludes. But here he decides that it's going to govern the cantata from beginning to end. And this is really amazing, actually. Uh, pretty unique uh, in the way he approaches this. Um, so he'll take a, 
a familiar chorale melody will be the hymn of the day uh, and use the text verbatim in the opening movement and the four-part chorale typically at the end. Uh, in the middle, however, the text will be paraphrased. Sometimes you, you may get a hint of the tune in the accompaniment or maybe in the voice, but mostly it's uh, through composed and the verses are sometimes a, a paraphrase of multiple verses stuck together multiple verses of the text, obviously. I'm not talking about the tune here, right? Uh, so again, he's extremely creative in, uh, in that period. The, one, one of the things I would recommend to our listeners here is if you are not familiar with, uh, with the cantatas of Jesbach or you find them a little forbidding, a little intimidating, um, the best place to start would be with these chorale cantatas. And there are a whole number of them that... Um, that use or govern are governed by familiar chorale tunes, hymns that are in our hymnal, the LSB. Um, so there are a good number that have not been translated and are not used, and maybe that's the next step of exploration. Go to these these uh, cantatas that employ other tunes that are not familiar to us, but sort of uh, have been historically part of our tradition. Um, so that, that would just be uh, something I would recommend to everyone. Listen to, to the cantata chorales first and then branch out from there. So just a That's little a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the chorale tends to be the, the very accessible part of the cantata. When, when, my, when my husband and I were looking through Bach music to use to celebrate this week, you know, the first thing that you go to is, is the chorale to see what the tune is, if it's familiar, if it's a hymn that we have in our hymnal, or at least a tune that we have in our hymnal. We are going to dig into more of these chorales, chorale cantatas, after we take a quick break. We're talking with Dr. Maurice Boyer during Bach week, talking about the theology of uh, J.S. Bach's music. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. <laughs> You're a miracle. You know that, right? A living, breathing, one-of-a-kind miracle. You were created to stand apart, to share your gifts in the service of others, to make an uncommon impact in a common world. And at Concordia University, it's our mission to help you do that, to live uncommon. To learn more about Concordia, go to cuw.edu. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. It is Bach week. We're talking about the theology of Bach's music. And uh, there's so much to dig in today. And we have Dr. Maurice Boyer joining us uh, to talk about all of this theology and the chorales, especially. Uh, those are uh, the, the very accessible parts of these cantatas, uh, very accessible parts of Bach's music, easy to recognize a lot of the tunes um, and the texts. So we're going to dig into some of that now. Uh, Maurice, oh, which which cantatas <laughs> or in chorales would you like to really dig in and, and give people an overview of, of how they can uh, really start to understand this music? Yeah, sure. Um, of course, I could start with any number of them, and uh, <laughs> but the, maybe I'll start with uh, the cantata, the cantatas for the first Sunday in Advent. There are two that are settings of Savior of the Nations come. So in LSB, that's three three two. Right, LSB 332, Savior of the Nations Come. Um, what could be really interesting to the listener would be to listen to those two cantatas. They're BWV 61 and 62. They're fairly short each, you know, 15, 20 minutes each. So that's not very much. Uh, and then there's an organ chorale prelude on the same uh, chorale melody. Uh, Matt Gerhardt may have mentioned it. It's uh, BWV 595. Uh, so that would be an, an interesting thing to do. So sing the hymn, listen to two cantatas, listen to the chorale prelude. Uh, and when you listen to the, to the chorales, don't read the text only from the hymnal. Um, seek out 
a literal translation of the chorale text. Because, of course, you know, the, the one that's in the hymnal is a literary version or literary translation. It's always interesting to see the slight divergences that may well be there in the text. Um, now just a couple of more musical things that sort of uh, show a little bit more what Bach is doing and how it is that he might uh, do theology through sound. So BWV 61, now here we're backtracking a little bit. We're no longer in Leipzig. Uh, BWV 61, it's 1714 in Weimar. Uh, and here, the opening movement, uh, chorale tune, of course, Savior of the Nations Come, appears in all of the voices successfully in descending order. Soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Uh, and it opens really interestingly with this French overture. So dim. So this very regal and uh, strong utterance at the beginning. Uh, it's interesting, the French overture is uh, with those double dotted and strong rhythms, which in the second half leads to the dance-like movement in, in triple meter. That sort of triple meter in the middle uh, is a dance that was associated with royalty in the French court. So what Bach is doing musically, uh, he's telling us that this uh, savior of the nations come is, or who is coming, is king. Uh, just, just, the word king does not appear in the text, but that's what he's saying, uh, right, uh, just with the musical gestures. So there's a rhetorical element that's saying one more thing than what the text is, is saying. So that's an example of what I was saying earlier. Um, for the, so that's just one thing that I could say about that. Uh, for number 62, uh, this is 1724, a year, uh, 10 years, a full decade later, he is now in Leipzig, completely revisits the same chorale tune. And now it's a, he begins with a chorale fantasia. If in fantasia, it's scored for two oboes and strings. And we're in compound meter. Right? So he's got this dance like feeling at the beginning, but there is a fierceness in some ways to this opening. Uh, the chorale melody passes from voices, voice to voice, but the first time you hear it, it's low in the bass, uh, bass uh, voice of the instrumental group. So you almost don't perceive it. It's right at the bottom there. It's as if this whole cry of Savior of the Nations come is uh, erupting from the bowels of the earth almost. It's like the whole creation is crying out, come. Uh, but again, he's just doing that through musical means. And at the first occurrence, it's wordless. Only after that do the voices enter in and declaim this. Um, but he starts just by this wordless gesture. And again, there's, there's a rhetorical gesture there. He's, uh, he said something that doesn't necessarily come out just in the words themselves. Uh, so that's a little detail, something to listen for when you're... Um, Maybe you could even listen to it this summer. It's always appropriate to say those words. Um, but uh, even maybe more meaningful would be to listen to it on the first Sunday of Advent uh, and just recognize the, the beauty of what Bach has done for our edification. I, I think we can listen to any Bach music any time of year. Yes, I know liturgically we you know, want to yeah, have them in the correct liturgical seasons or the appropriate liturgical seasons, but I have been playing Christmas oratorios all week. So yep. it's never a bad time <laughs> for Bach. Never a bad time. <laughs> um, any other any other cantatas that you you want to unpack or, or dig into? Well um I will mention a few that I would recommend that everyone listen to. Um there's the, the cantata for the purification, which is uh, the a setting of the German Nunc Dimittis. Uh, the Cantico of Simeon, uh, is uh, Cantata 125. And that is another one of those absolute gems. It was another one that you can listen to, um, sing, uh, and then after that, or before that, sing the hymn, and also listen to the uh, chorale prelude. So it's BWV 125, and then the hymn in the uh, in the in the hymnal is LSB 938, In Peace and Joy I Now Depart. And then the chorale prelude is 616. I will, um, 
uh, send send this information to you both so that you can post it uh, mm -hmm. so that our audience can actually access them for this information and uh, experience this music for themselves. There's only so much that we can obviously do uh, in these few minutes here. Um, so that would be one that I would recommend. And again, it's a beautiful evocation of that text, um, which again is uh, one very much for identification. Another one I would recommend would be listening to uh, Cantata One, which is probably one of the more famous ones. Wie schön leuchtet der Morgenstern, right? So in our hymnal, that's LSB 395, O Morning Star, How Fair and Bright. Uh, there isn't a chorale prelude for that one, but of course you can sing the, the hymn straight out of the hymnal. And here also, uh, one of the things that's remarkable in, is the setting. How, how is it that Bach voices this and how does he... Um, um, how does he make this happen musically? Um, it's a grand uh, piece in some ways in that there are a lot of performing forces. Uh, there are uh, uh, flutes, oboes, uh, trumpets, not really. They should be horns, although they're not really playable on modern instruments. Um, it's a really festive and colorful texture beyond the choir singing in the background, but uh, but it starts in a very intimate way. So it's as if it, sp it speaks um, from this place of the individual gathering uh, in his mind or her mind and thinking about this, this narrative, right? And then suddenly it erupts in this, into this joyous uh, utterance and, this, it, and it's so colorful. I mean, it's as if you can see this, uh, this star shining. It's just shimmering with light. Um, in this opening movement, especially. And then, of course, there are great arias that succeed that. Um, and one last little thing I would encourage everyone to listen to. You probably already know this one. It's Cantata 4, Christlach and Todesbanden. Uh, in the hymnal, it's LSB 458, Christ Jesus Lay in Death Strong Bands. Um, so, of course, the cantata for Easter Sunday. Now, this is a cantata that he wrote that may well be his first cantata maybe 1707, not quite sure. Uh, so at the very least, one can say that he was in his early 20s when he wrote it. And it's a remarkable, remarkably mature piece. It's as if he came out uh, fully formed uh, <laughs> when he wrote his first piece. Um, there's, it's, a, it's a masterpiece right off the bat. Um, there is also an organ chorale prelude that goes with this, number 625, uh, BW 625. Um, and this is what would be called in per omnes versus uh, chorale cantata. And so what's interesting about this is that you will hear the chorale tune throughout the whole work, except for in the instrumental uh, introduction prelude, uh, although it does have hints of the melody. Um, and you also have the chorale text verbatim the whole way through, uh, which is a great, uh, a great thing to um, helps us as listeners get into the piece and, and um, uh, just by connecting us with a text and a tune that we're, with which we're very familiar. Uh, and here again, it's amazing how from movement to movement, uh, Bach gets so deeply into the text and evokes it in a way that um, probably uh, casts a different light on each verse of the text than we would necessarily expect just from reading the text without any music associated with it. Um, uh, in that piece, also what he is, does very amazingly is uh, he not only operates movement by movement, uh, but he's also thinking structure, structurally. And this is an, another layer that Bach is able to, to sort of... Um, build in to these structures, musical structures that he composes. In this piece, he builds in uh, what you would call a chiasmus, so a K-shaped, I mean a chi-shaped, right, an X-shaped um, structure to it. So the opening movement answers the final movement, the second movement ends, uh, answers the sixth movement, and it's a seven-movement uh, hymn. And so the fourth movement, which is the, 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 the fight, the struggle uh, in which deliverance occurred, um, 
smack dab in the middle. So again, he's built a, cru uh, a cruciform shape right into his piece. So again, just now that's another layer at, at which Bach is operating. And what we've said so far has been sort of a more local um, uh, rhetorical uh, gesture. In this one, you might say it's a, it's a, a deeper level of uh, uh, semantics going on here. Mm -hmm. So those are a few more things to, to, that might potentially uh, draw the listener into the, this remarkable repertoire. And there are so many more things we could talk about if we had three more hours with you, Maurice. <laughs> uh, it's just, there is so much in all of Vox music. It is just jam-packed full of all of this great stuff. Uh, what a what a, um, a heritage we have with all of Bach's music. And of course, yes, we will post all of these things, uh, all of the cantatas you mentioned with the show notes today. Um, hopefully everybody will want to go listen to them mm -hmm. and uh, see what they recognize from our hymnal. I think mm -hmm. that's a pretty cool thing to connect the church music from the 1700s to the things that we're still singing today in our churches. Mm -hmm. uh, what, a, what a cool thing that is. Uh, Dr. Boyer, it has been so awesome to have you on Bach Week with us to celebrate. J.S. Bach, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been my great pleasure. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere.